This is episode 14 of Filming in Thailand, welcoming Nicolas Simon. Ready? Yes. Okay. Tarot Documentary presents Filming in Thailand, a podcast for movie lovers with exclusive stories from behind the scenes. Rolling sound. Sound rolling. And action. How are the cookies? Hi, I'm your host, Stefan Lambert, and this is a new episode of Filming in Thailand. And here we are. This is a new episode of Filming in Thailand with our guest today, Nicolas Simon. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Wow. But we stop here. It doesn't look so good for me. Too. Who is our guest? Uh, who, who am I? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, gonna, I'll, I'll let you go. I'm, I'm going to tell you who okay. you are. Love it. According to internet. Okay. So it must be 100% true okay. and reliable. Um. You started in, in Vietnam, then you moved to Thailand, and here you are. So this is... <laughs> is, it, is it brief? Uh, that's brief, and uh, that sums it all up. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I thought. First of all, Nicolas, are you filming in Thailand? Right now? Um, it's have been... Um, I opened up um, my current company, Indochina Productions, in 2010, and in 2011, we absorbed an existing Thai um, company called Legend Films that had done uh, Rambo 4 and uh, Street Fighter. And because um, I originally in 2010 had opened up just in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos and realized I knew before, but realized that Thailand is really the epicenter, not only for Southeast Asia, but for film production in Asia. But le le in my mind, Legend is a, is a Hollywood company. Um, no, that's legendary. legendary. Um, there was a Thai company called Legend, Legend. that we um, uh, that we absorbed. Over, yeah. yep. I'd originally come to Asia in 1994. I went to Columbia University um, in New York City. I thought that I was going to be a journalist. I came to Vietnam not knowing anyone, and then soon after I arrived, I realized I didn't. Um, like writing, which is hard to be a journalist. <laughs> okay. So um, at a bar, at the Q Bar, David Jacobson now has... Q Bar uh, in Vietnam. In Vietnam, 1994. Um, I was at the bar and I convinced the regional head of um, Ogilvy and Mather that I could produce along with my new friend who is uh, production managing a um, a French film called Cyclo, the second movie of Trang Ranh Hung. And um, I convinced him that I could produce TV commercials. And we had 10 days and $30,000 to do three Pepsi Blue campaign. I, th I thought I'd struck it rich then. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So you, you shot these TVCs in Vietnam? Shot those in Vietnam. Um, back then, they had, uh, I mean, it was still um, the remnants of the Soviet empire. And uh, we did processing and telecine. Um, in Thailand, which, oh, sorry, in Vietnam, which we never did again after that. Um, <laughs> but, tell us why. Uh, yeah. but, um, you know, we produced it. And as uh, the regional head of Ogilvy and Mather said, if the uh, client liked it, he'd pay the second half. And if he didn't like the client didn't like it, we wouldn't get our second 50. So Oof. I was 23 years old Oof. and, uh, That's laughed, tough. laughed it off, but uh, we got paid okay. and, um, then that company um, went strong. It's now known as Sudest. It was initially Lazanek Vietnam. We had the first joint venture um, uh, with the uh, Ministry of Culture and a Hang Film Zaifong Liberation Film Studio. And we ended up both doing production service and local production. And I sold that company in the early 2000s and moved back to Los Angeles. But what gave you the energy at that time to, you know, to partner with the Vietnamese government, to uh, pitch for TV commercial, to work with Pepsi, I mean... I had a French partner, and anything in a French accent sounds good, so... Uh, C'est vrai. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but you work on movies, uh, so... <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd, and I'd always, uh, you know, I had uh, grown up in sort of a cinema parody CEO um, in, uh, in a small college town where my father taught in Beloit, Wisconsin. 
and um, we didn't. I grew up without a TV, and I used to go to Winston. because it didn't exist at that time, or uh, it's close, but um, no, my, <laughs> it, it died when Nixon was uh, <laughs> resigning, and um, when the Saturn rocket was going to the moon. So um, okay. we uh, they never bought a new one. So I, I grew up going to the college um, to their. They had um, three days a week for a dollar in sort of classic movies. And um, that's what I grew up on and um, sort of, you know, drunk at a bar in Saigon. I figured out that I could uh, start from the top down and produce. But wh why did you, uh, did you start uh, in Asia, in Vietnam and not in Thailand? These are two entry points. Because um, I have a tendency to always make things more difficult um, <laughs> for myself. But um, so, saying that Thailand is easier than Vietnam? Uh, the, yes, yeah. Th Thailand, even then, had a much more established uh, um, economy and culture. I mean, I was drawn. My father's a Hungarian immigrant. I grew up in Wisconsin, and the the kids in my class who I closest identified with were um, the Vietnamese, um, okay. who they, when they came over in 1975, and so I was what. Um, five, six years old, so, you know, and then they became close friends and they were, ended up rising within a year to top of the class. And um, so I think that, that it's searching for my history, um, being half Hungarian, um, I think I identified a lot with Vietnam and there's such a stigma and uh, impression on, um, on Americans and American history and culture that uh, I was drawn to Vietnam initially, and it was a real anomaly, and it was difficult, and I always like a challenge. Excellent, excellent, yeah. yes. So you, you mentioned that um, you had in your university this, uh, this pass for three days a week of uh, you know, cinema, uh, movie classics, uh, uh, screening, and uh, um, is, is there in your memory one film that, Really st strikes you and said, "Ah, this is what I want to do." I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking of it. But watching Apocalypse Now, I mean, watching um, you know it's Marx Brothers movies, Buster Keaton movies. Um, you know, I'm as you can see on IMDb. I do. I, I just like to work with good people, and I love all genres. Um, and you know, this year it's really crazy because we have a, um, a reality TV show that I co-own that I produced. Um, that I never thought I was going to do, but you know, working with good people and the talent, an opportunity. You're, you're referring to Dean Dynasty, yeah, exactly. The first ever reality TV from Thailand being broadcast. Yeah, the I, I think that there, it's, I'll let you do those words. HBO has a different. I think it's the first reality show on HBO. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, so it's. Um, but it. So I've. I watch it. I watch everything, and um, you know, I have um, I, things that I'm more drawn to. Um, but you know, it's really about working with good people. Okay, so from Apocalypse Now to Dean Dynasty, <laughs> it's a long <laughs> way to go. I'm going to book the studio for another ten hours. Exactly. Um, okay, it's okay. We're, yep. we're, we're, we have green light for you. I have time. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Nicolas, you have uh, been working in and around Thailand for quite some time now. What is so specific about filming in Thailand? I think that it's um, it's a combination of things, and um, you know, I, first of all, I think they they have more of a structure than the surrounding uh, countries. I mean, the biggest competition, you know, if you want to look at Asia as a center. Whereas that it's, you know, Malaysia tried instituting a, um, and they have um, a film incentive, which is actually, uh, you can actually get more money back. More money from Malaysia than from Thailand. Than from Thailand. But you have to import the crew uh, from Thailand well, to Malaysia. It, uh, um, I don't know, I'm going to start speaking French, but... Uh, um, <laughs> you, you know, then it's going to be more romantic, as you said. Yeah, no, Switch on the light. <laughs> it, it, let's say... Um, We can speak French. Okay. okay. No, 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 no. Let, let's just. Uh, I'll concentrate first on Thailand. Thailand has amazing crew. It's the crew is getting deeper and deeper. The com uh, country has instituted um, a like simplified authorization process, visa process, um, and also now a film incentive. There are improvements that um, we're we're hoping are instituted that further streamline. Um, all those processes and make Thailand that much more competitive. But I'd say the, the 
the, the film industry goes hand in hand with the hospitality industry. And um, Thailand having some of the best five-star hotels and, and uh, hospitality industry throughout the, the country mm-hmm. makes it possible to shoot in, in a lot of locations. Um, and it, it, there's a service mentality. You know, we've, um, Pre-COVID, we opened up in Japan. And they're a country that has no service mentality. And um, also, um, obstacles are all, uh, just the structure of their society make it very difficult to, to work. So we're doing a number of projects there, but it, it's um, the standards and practices are, uh, let's say, more difficult. I've always been impressed by the, the, um, uh, the, the way Thailand is always coming first because of its uh, ne- the, the problem that the neighboring countries are, are facing and have difficulty to overcome. And of course, because of the quality of, of Thailand, the inner quality. The, yeah. But it seems that the, the competition, the competitors are doing their best not to be as good as, as Thailand. I, I mean, I, that's one way to look at it. Japan's just instituting a new film incentive. There's a younger generation that's rising up. Um, we're, so what we do when we shoot in Japan often, off, I mean, we have a project going on next month that will be 100% Japanese. We were involved in Tokyo Vice um, uh, on the behind the scenes, but we're able to do, crew that out 100% um, from Thailand. But when we do... Um, other projects, so we do a number of TV commercials, and we just did recent ones for Google, for um, was it Google, Amazon, and um, a- Apple before, but another. You're missing Facebook, and you have, yeah. you have them all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was one of the. That's um, just oh, Expedia was the other one. Oops. <laughs> yeah, and then a different uh, industry, but um, and when we were over there, we brought over. Um, Thai um, line producers. We often bring it in um, Thai accountants um, uh, and also the client servicing. And it's, I'd say, if you're shooting something Japan for Japan and for a Japanese client, you don't need to do this. Before, uh, if you have to have the service mentality, Thailand. There's no place better than Thailand. I mean, our biggest competition isn't isn't the region. It's South Africa. It used to be the Ukraine before before the war. Now we have East. You know, we just lost a big job to Warsaw. Um, you know, so Eastern Europe and South Africa and sometimes Mexico are our biggest competitors. We'll talk about the competition okay. in a, in a moment. But the, if, just one second. That's for, that's for TV commercials. That's for, for TV commercials for short form. And for long form? For long form, um, uh, what's interesting, what's happening now um, is uh, the studios are now seeing Thailand as a place not only to shoot, um, let's say, Thailand for Thailand, Thailand for Vietnam. On the creator, we shot uh, over 80% of the film here. We also shot in Nepal, Indonesia, Cambodia, and, and Japan. But that's interesting. You, you mentioned the creator. We'll talk in the second yep. part about the creator because the creator could have been shot anywhere in the world. Yep. Uh, I mean, and, and it, it was shot in Thailand. So let, let's keep it for uh, a okay. bit later. Okay. There is a, a saying about Thailand. You say Thailand, land of smile. And I would like to, to make it Thailand, land of smile, filming and frustration honestly i don't uh, i get frustrated shooting i've shot in la new york uh philadelphia i think that um you know good directors are always asking to make the impossible possible um (laughs) it's the job of a director uh, and it's the job of the producer to manage that and um i find um uh, i find thailand incredibly and you know i've made my home here now and it, I f- uh, find it very um, film friendly. Um, I'd say forward thinking. It's um, you know with the changing governments and you know that structure. It's often hard to get um, policies implemented and improved, but they have been. You know the f- foreign after tax um, exemption was passed uh, last year. You know, there's talk, um, I believe it's been passed, but it hasn't been instituted in the royal decree of increasing the film incentive to 30%. Um, but it's, honestly, I don't have any complaints here. I mean, it's 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 home now. It's um, the base of our business is here. We shot a big, um, a big TV commercial in the Maldives, 40 um, 
Thai crew. Half of them uh, flew over with us. Half of them okay. flew business class because there aren't enough flights now. I mean, it was <laughs> I, it was a real treat. I didn't even get to go, but uh, people said it was a real treat. You know, we were shooting in Japan, Vietnam, Philippines, um, Cambodia. We have an upcoming job in Sri Lanka, and there's normally a, um, a decent Thai component to it. And just, um, you know, we just, again, we want to work with good people. And, and Thailand has just had the um, sort of the history um, since Deer Hunter um, to, you know, that's built up crews. And I'll give a shout out to um, Santa. It's um, uh, who has started his uh, first major um, film uh, production service company called Santa Films. And if you look at the difference between the way um, the Philippines that had actually more films in the 70s and 80s um, developed and the way that um, the film industry for international production service developed, and I give it credit mainly to Santa, um, is that he pinpointed um, that you had to have a whole new crew. It wasn't about turning the, the very good Thai crew, mm -hmm. who, um, but it was about training up people from the hospitality industry. Okay. Who then, and over, you know, now that was 1970s, 1980s, and a lot of people were, you know, my first partner, uh, Pierre, she worked in a hotel and then saw it was a lot more fun in film production. She jumped over <laughs> and, and worked there. And meanwhile, the Philippines, what they did is um, they brought in people who um, had worked in the Filipino industry and then just placed them on, on Hollywood projects. But the problem is, is that the standards and practices are totally different. And in the Philippines? Uh, 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 in, lo in local, even in like local okay. Thai. And so by concentrating on training people up from the hospitality or straight out of college, you could you could start these people who understood the standards and practices and what a Hollywood movie um, really did. And, and, you know, now, you know, there's another company that's taking care of aliens. I think that they're shooting the full season of it. Right? Yeah, 20 Chris Lowenstein yeah. was, was with us a few episodes ago and yeah. he, he told us many many behind the scenes of, so yeah. I'm expecting you to tell me, me many behind the scene about the creator okay when we come back in a minute but before that let's play a game it's called the top five five seconds per questions it's very fast if it's too fast you okay. just uh, hit the buzzer over there so um, five favorite places to film uh, five very good places to film um, I, first of all Thailand second of all uh, I mean we shoot all over the place Thailand, because it's easy, we always love coming back. I'm using more than five seconds. Um, Japan, because it's crazy and unpredictable. Um, Bangladesh, because it's like shooting on the moon and you never know what's coming coming next. Um, Vietnam, because it reads so well on the camera. And Maldives, because I want to go. <laughs> yeah, that's a good reason. If we could have a special episode of filming in Thailand, in Maldives, you know, on location, I'm up for it. Uh, five uh, five favorite actors. Oh, maybe it, those you you've been uh, working I mean, with. It, it, it's acting. It, I mean, it, I there was a long time ago. I want, uh, thought of becoming one. I admire them all because they're putting. Um, they're putting themselves on the line and who knows, they could be too short, too fat, to the accents wrong or this, and they're being- Enough about me, let's talk about your favorite actors. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I did a, a small movie called um, A Prayer for Dawn that I produced with James Seamus. Um, it was originally um, supposed to be Charlie Hunnam in mm -hmm. the lead. Um, financing fell out, he fell out, various reasons. Um, ended up getting Joe Cole and less than a third or a fourth of the budget with him. He was a perfect guy for the, an amazing actor and through himself. And he, he became that part. Um, watching Robert Downey Jr. Uh, work on uh, The Sympathizer, where he plays uh, multiple characters, sort of similar to Dr. Strangelove, um, to see him interacting with director Park, um, who, um, who'd done, who's done Old Boy. Um, the, you know, that was brilliant um alice and jamie um the academy award winning winner from i Tonya, uh, you know it was and ken fantastic Wat film and ken watanabe um were both on the creator john david washington was just and 
not only on, on camera, I'm gonna, uh, literally I'm going to cry, I'm getting it, but the way he worked with the crew and um, uh, and just threw himself it, into the production and into Thailand and working with the um, with the director was you know second to none. Five favorite directors. Oh, we'll have a break after. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going five favorite directors. Off, often, um, either the favorite or least favorite, the person we just ah, worked with. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd say Director Park from um, The Sympathizer. I um, He saw something in that book, um, in that project that I didn't see. And he has such a clear vision and clear... Um, uh, tone and and um, he's he's phenomenal. Um, again, I'll go back to Prayer Before Dawn. Um, for me, it, the 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 project so e easily could have been a cliche. And um, Jean Stefan, uh, the director, and I, he also had previously done a movie called Johnny Mad Dog, and then had a, a movie this year at Cannes called Black Flies. Mm -hmm. um, is I, we keep looking for another project to do together, and he um, he saw something in that that I didn't see, and it, what he's told me it's for almost no money that we had in the budget. You know, I, I was able to, and our crew was able to provide him with everything that he needed, and so it's um, you know it's uh, that all of those people were really really special to work with. Five of your most, and I, yes. I have to, sure, I have to put Gareth in there too. I just saw the creator for the first time. I've seen snippets here and there, and again, it's there was two plus hours of going into a mind of um, a real visionary, and you know, we I'll tell you more about it later. But we were on this uh, start, uh, on the project from its sort of nascent stages all the way through, and and to see what he pulled off was just incredible. It's incredible. Five yeah. of your most iconic production. I think you gave us one already. Um, I'll do the creator, the um, for multiple reasons. Um, the sympathizer. We have an upcoming one, um, uh, season three of the White Lotus, and that's all I'll say about it. Um, is uh, but already that's been a journey. So that's three. A prayer before dawn. Um, I'll, I'll put a prayer before dawn is so special that takes the number four and five. Number four and five. Yeah. So, guys, you have to watch the uh, prayer before dawn. That's for sure. And um, your five most hated questions. <laughs> bring, bring them on. <laughs> okay, work on that. You are listening to Filming in Thailand, a podcast by Tero Documentary, with your host, Stefan Lambert. Is there a project, a film, a TVC, a series that, that was, you know, a game changer for you? Um, I, I think that it's... That, that's, uh, that's Fiat with her mobile. Okay, that's again, that. she forgot to switch <laughs> off today. First rule in production. <laughs> no problem. I know for myself and for my company, I have three different companies for my companies. So you have Indochina? Indochina Productions, Studio Muso in um, Japan, and we're soon to announce an amazing project that we're a um, production company and I'll be a producer on uh, an English language adaptation of a uh, uh, well-known Japanese IP. Um, and then the third company, uh, 247 Pictures, that. Um, Patrick Co Cohen with Patrick Carr. That was in a previous episode. Uh, yeah. Of and, Thailand. and so each one's doing different things. Um, you know, I, I find it really interesting with 247 Pictures is because we were actually, um, we uh, were fortunate, um, but also very strategic, is that we um, own our IP. Okay, that's and, interesting. Um, that's very interesting. And we're able to do to work with the streamers in a way where where we retain the rights. And uh, so you're not acting only as a, an executive producer as a, a production service company, but now you're you're generating your own IP. Yes, and that that's what Studio Muso in Japan is set up with. We're in-house producers for two of the largest um, manga companies. I have two partners. One, Harry Tanaka, who is on the board of directors of Studio Ghibli, and before that, he was 15 years at various GM positions for Disney Japan. Then I have another um, super talented uh, partner um, uh, who's well-versed in production, 
And then our fourth partner, Tomo, has um, uh, he's more from the business side, and he's built up dot coms. So we're doing a, mm. a number of interesting things. We consulted for Amazon Studios. We're in house, as I mentioned, to two manga companies. We've um, a developing um, original IP, and um, then two four seven pictures. That's what its mandate is too. Indochina started as production service only. Now we're in 14 different countries. Or we call them territories because we see Bali and sure. you know, we- Westerners see Bali and Indonesia as two I need to avoid places. some uh, politically. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Concern. Political yeah. concern. Um, so, but we do probably about uh, 40 to 50 percent of our work um, in Thailand, then Japan, Vietnam, um, Cambodia are really popular. We're pushing for Malaysia to increase, and then we do the odd projects in Nepal and Bangladesh. And so, what, what was it? Inter- why was, did, are you moving into IP? Uh, IP? Um, it's sort of just. I, and the question before that that sure. I didn't, didn't answer too. And that's okay. Which is, I'm used to it, that. It, <laughs> it's it's just a really interesting interesting time. Um, I think with the explosion, um, you know, and now the retraction of um, of the the streamers and the studios, and there's somewhat of a consolidation. There's probably going to be further con- uh, market consolidation. But um, what I've found, and where Studio Muso came up and even now, Indochina owns or is attached to to a couple different projects. Um, is that um, studios? Unfortunately, um, the thing that suffered the most in this rapid expansion, or really never existed in Southeast Asia, was um, uh, on a studio level, was development. And it's the weak point, of, and it's a weak and, area. And now it's a, it's also becoming. I, really see it as it's becoming the weak point in the consolidation um, and also the rapid rise of a lot of streamers. It doesn't make sense for a shareholder or development. It, cost, it doesn't bring anything. And it, it, and it takes time and they need content immediately. And so um, seeing that opportunity in the market is where we've um, expanded. And it's also like during COVID, I mean, I started up during COVID, I started both Studio Muso and then also 247 Pictures because I knew coming out of it, production service will never be the same. And it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, on the short form things, people are, uh, it's harder to get them to travel halfway around the world as it was uh, pre COVID. Um, it's the, also with the impen- ever impending recession, is people are more con- cost conscious and with, uh, you know, flights now, business class being eight thousand, ten thousand bucks, mm-hmm. you know, that's double the price of what it used to be. Sure, um, all those things add up. So, I s- saw a hole in the market. I saw um, through my, I had plans, but having started business in Vietnam, worked on the communist five year plan. I thought it was going to take five years. It's actually we're we're in the midst of it now, and it sort of it balances out. Um, our portfolio, you know, we've been able okay. to we've been able to um, adapt uh, to in a um, in a better way to the you know half of our uh, to this strikes of which WGA is just resolved, but SAG is still um, ever going. So you're referring to the strikes uh, in, in the states going on in the states, uh, and it, it de- it's decimated our long form build business. B- B- oh, really? Uh, for production service, yeah, nothing's because happening because so some suddenly you don't have production coming in yeah they, and uh, to to clarify they are they are basically asking for better remuneration and uh, more recognition for the, the creative work that and AI is also um, tie in the creator there too but AI is very um, big uh, both for sag and also for WGA and how how the studios and streamers are going to deal with it I think that I haven't read the um, I haven't read the uh, final, um, you know, contract um, for WGA, but I know that it was addressed, and um, that you know, it's not going to be allowed just to feed things into Chat GPT and um, and replace writers. And then for actors, the big thing is, is you know, um, and it's already happened somewhat in in various productions where you hire an extra, you scan their image, and then you use it multiple times this is happening already yeah w- with no legal framework around that 
Interesting. Yeah. Uh, scary. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So what was, if there is any, the project that was a game changer for you? Not, not only on the business front, but also for, for your own self, where suddenly you say, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm within this industry, or you looked around, you say, wow, I'm living the dream. Or, or the person in front of you is, is, is a big name? So, it, it, I mean, there have been, I'd say almost every project that we've, uh, we've done or I've been involved with, Kong Skull Island, you know, we shot six weeks first unit um, with, you know, Tom Hiddleston, Brie Larson, Sam Jackson, John C. O'Reilly, you know. Th and that was in which island? No, no, there was in, um, we shot in Ninbin south of Hanoi, Halong Bay, and then also Phung Nha Khe Binh, which mm -hmm. is um, uh, north of Da Nang, um, at the world's largest cave complex. And so we shot six weeks. So that, when I was doing that, that was the biggest thing. Right afterwards, I did a prayer before dawn for a below $2 million movie. Yeah, that's a big, big gap. It was, our budget was not even the craft service budget on um Hong Kong and I came back and I we shot that out and then you know to go to premiere in LA for Kong at Grauman's Chinese Theater or it was at the Dolby where they do the mm -hmm. Oscars and then at um and then to go to Cannes and have red carpet and we had a 10 15 minute standing ovation at the Palais for, for, for a pre pre for, for Don yes for me both those things I was on a you know on a super high and that was phenomenal but but then they come back and we we did some tv commercials that for me blew blew us out of the water and um two of them were with adam berg one was for dhl and another uh tying in with james bond and then another one for uber before grab bought it out and to work with him and to see like again he's i love working with directors who surprised me and you give them everything, and then they take it way beyond your expectations. And he did that with both of um, those TV commercials. And um, But I'd say to, right now I'm riding the high of um, the creator, and um, I think that that you know, is something I've been, we've been involved with since, uh, I believe, 2017, and to see it... So almost six years. Yeah, and you know it was just... I don't think it was even a full script then. It was just an idea in, in Gareth's mind. He came out with Jim Spencer, his producer, and for less than most TV commercials, they put together a trailer and we traveled through Vietnam. And he actually is good friends with Jordan, who directed um, Kong Skull Island, which is how uh, Gareth, uh, Gareth got the bug uh -huh. and all that stuff of, of Asia. And... Um, you know, and to see it grow, and and on a technological side, um, we there's some articles floating around the the internet. But what he was able to do, knowing VFX and knowing cameras, um, and working with Greg Fraser, the Academy Award winning DP, we shot on prosumer cameras. Granted, the lenses are are um, you know the, the cinematic uh, and very expensive lenses, but you can go out and buy the camera for four thousand dollars. <laughs> You you were talking about the creator, mm -hmm. so the creator is this uh, fantastic sci-fi movie, uh, you know, taking place in a world where uh, humans have decided that uh, AI was uh, was not so good. Finally, that uh, there was some issues. I'm not going to spoil anything, but uh, uh, basically, uh, America is re refighting the his, its own war in in Asia because you have the good guys and the bad guys. I don't say more. Um, that's for uh, it's been it's been it's been said that uh, the creator um, brings something new to the filming in Thailand scene. One, this film could have been uh, produced anywhere in the world, executive produced anywhere in the world, and it was produced in Thailand. So this is something I want to know from you. How did how did you pull this up? And second is um, it opens the door to a new way to see the um, service, the production service industry in Thailand that is not only because, you know, you have a, a nice exterior or a great crew, but you can shoot in Thailand um, the way you could shoot in, at, I mean, around London or in Los Angeles or anywhere in the world. So first, um, you had competition for the creator um, how did you convince people that the place 
of shooting should be here in Thailand mainly? I mean, for, for me, the way that we go about it, and one reason we structured Indochina and being in so many different territories is, um, in, in the end, it's the director's choice and the studio's choice where they want to go. And there have been projects that I absolutely love, and either they went to another company or they went to um, another country. Mm -hmm. And so um, having, you know, meeting Gareth in the beginning, meeting Jim, the producer, and New Regency is a studio we work quite a, uh, um, have worked with quite a few times, and there are projects that were supposed to come and never came. Um, and it was sort of, it's a dating game, but then it's also, you know, when they come, they say jump and we say how, how high, and it's really about, um, you know, Gareth, where did he, he traveled over six weeks or eight weeks, traveled from Nepal to Cambodia to Vietnam, and we supported him in each place with different people, and, you know, my hope was he's going to choose us and, and some of the countries we work in, and it worked out, you know, because because of covid vietnam was knocked out we shut the whole thing during covid which was a challenge in and of itself um and a huge bite out of the budget but he we were able to still do um a thailand based production for around 16 weeks um to do about a week in cambodia a week in indonesia and a week in nepal mm -hmm. and then a couple of days in japan and there were Thai crew who traveled with him to all of those as a first uh, first unit, as first unit, yeah. And we had uh, and John David, the main actor, traveled to all of those locations too. And then they went to um, uh, they shot, I believe, three uh, three weeks or so on the stage in the UK, which I did try to uh, pull here, but it's um, ILM and they have their own stage and and everything, and it's just easier to do it in the UK. But it's you know it it. it the stars, let's say the stars aligned on that. The, the suppliers are Thai. Mm -hmm. There are not so many joint venture with foreign studios or foreign companies investing in Thailand and joining for, you know, having their own set, their own equipment, their own team. They, you, you have your companies, um, you have local Thai companies, uh, but I don't see, maybe there, there, there are and I don't know, um, foreign studios, foreign companies, you know, investing in Thailand, saying, oh, there, there is so much business going on. Let's get a share. I think uh, COVID and post-COVID, um, from the, uh, the creator, Aliens will do it. Um, you know, if, if White Lotus ends up shooting here, um, White Lotus will definitely have an effect. Studios are, in the, in the end, conservative corporations. Um, and um, at the moment, it's also the film incentive is attractive, but it's not truly competitive. Mm -hmm. And it has a cap, which um, can be problematic um, for larger budget projects. What's the cap today? Um, what is it? Because uh, I know there is a minimum. Uh, there is it's a... A minimums. Right now, um, it's 20%, and it's... I believe it's uh, um, two million dollar. I think the the the, the well, it's, floor. it's it's a, the floor. You have to spend uh, fifty million Thai baht, and the maximum you can get back, I believe, is one hundred and fifty. Okay, um, and they do allow on TV series to break it up, but the way that the way that you break it up is not simple and not not easy and straightforward. How surprising! <laughs> yeah, so I I understand. You know, there are worries about having enough budget to attract it, but if they lifted the cap, um, you know, and if they um, also increase it to 30%, it's only going to make um, foreign investment that much more attractive. There are some um, deals with major Hollywood players on the infrastructure side that we've um, we've been involved in talks with. There, so I, all I can say is there, there's interest but I think that it hasn't yet gone over the threshold. But there is interest. There is we interest. can imagine that within five, 10 years top, uh, there will be more ventures uh, in this field. I know I'm here. There's a new license that um, uh, I'm getting that will make that um, a lot more attractive. Um, you know, it's the other thing that, you know, plays, they're very attractive things for the EEC, the Eastern Economic Cor Cor Corridor. Corridor. But unfortunately, that's outside of the Bangkok zone where all the crew is and stuff. So, um, you know, I think that you're going to... And there have, are no studios there. Uh, and 
why would you build it if you have to house the crew, which is one of the biggest problems in pi former Pinewood, now Iskandar mm -hmm. Studio in Malaysia. Um, so, you know, it, it's, but I, I won't, would not be surprised in the next two to three years if a lot's happening. It's also, you know, um, something that would help the industry a lot here. And you can look, Malaysia's actually with, um, done it and Australia has done it so well, which is you divide the, um, or you make it so that post-production, you can qualify for the incentive without production and post only. And if they had post only here, that would help a lot with volume stages um, and um, you know various post-production graphics. Because today post-production is not included in this exactly. scheme. And the, there's a company, Base FX, um, that does uh, a lot of work for ILM and Lucas Films. They're, I believe they have a thousand or two thousand employees in KL, and they, from my understanding, they set up to take advantage of the um, Malaysian um, film incentive. Of course, I yeah. mean it makes sense from yeah. from a remote location. You look at the financial side first. Exactly. Probably. The creator, so uh, was shot for quite what, three weeks in Thailand. Sixteen. Sixteen weeks. Yeah. The creator was shot for 16 weeks in Thailand. Um, what was your job there, your daily routine? Um, I'm uh, the co-producer on it. Um, I um, Different projects I operate in different ways. And my, but on our service work, uh, what I've really seen, and we, when, we first, when I first established the company, is that I knew that the only way to grow was um, to help build up crew. And so now, and most of them are all freelancers, but there are, so there's a woman on the creator, a woman on the mag, both Thai women who are line producers. So they okay. were there on day to day because I'm like- The key person. The key person. For me, I'm a decent line producer. I'm not a great line producer. Okay, can you name them? Um, there's uh, uh, P. Bird was on, um, on the Meg, she also did Penguin Bloom, and a number of, uh, she was a production manager on A Prayer Before Dawn. Now she's the Thai creative producer um, on White Lotus. Um, and then uh, P. Pam, she, um, we started with her on um, on the long format on Aero Unit in Bangladesh uh, <laughs> for Avengers. So and, you sent her to Bangladesh? Yeah. And she's uh, coming back? And she came back, and uh, it was a crazy experience. Um, and then um, from that, she came to um, uh, Vietnam and was the uh, Asian production manager for um, Kong Skull Island. Um, and then she's now line produced the creator. She was working on Michael Mann's Way 1968 that was going to shoot um, there was a band of brothers set in Vietnam. Okay. Um, but that unfortunately fell apart. Um, and then she uh, did extraction and then uh, the creator. Um, yeah. And so. So way, what was your your job so on, on the, the I, creator? Your I, own job, yourself, okay. not the company. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a co uh, credited as a co-producer. What I really see my job is, is setting things up um, so that they have the, each production has the right team on it. And Jim and Pam and then um, Leck and all these uh, Thai crew were interviewed in the in the Thai press and the wardrobe um, actually the uh -huh. wardrobe designer there's we had a Thai production designer wardrobe designer prop master um, and also supervising location manager all Thais all who oversaw all the Asian things, and they were credited, they were their heads of department working directly with And them. sometimes they act as extra also in the film. I recognize some cases. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> these guys were too busy. I don't think they ever jumped in, in, in there. But, um, uh, but so we really structure it where each production is sort of independent. I, I float between the different productions, but I'm there. I, I'm there very heavily during prep. Uh, making sure that um, things are crewed up properly, the government relations, um, and you know there were a lot of issues um, on the creator uh, shooting during COVID. We shot in, I believe it was seventeen provinces in the end, and a lot of the seventeen provinces in Thailand. Uh, yeah, and a lot of those had never had film production, let alone film production during COVID. 
So um, there is a lot of uh, back channeling and a lot of, um, you know, the, I have to say in the end, the, the government and a lot of the ministers were incredibly supportive, um, which is something that plays into, um, you know, Thailand growing. You know, there's one of the f- of course. few places that did so many productions during COVID. They had Shantaram, Miss Marvel, Greatest Beer Run. Um, but all coming to basically two or three companies, uh, yours being one of them. Yeah, I'd say there's us, Living Films, um, there's uh, Peston Films, Santa's uh, two sons uh, run that. They did Five Bloods, they did Fast and Furious, um, and, and they did the, the Thai Cave Rescue. Um, and then there's also Thai Occidental that did Shantaram. Um, so there, I think there are over 200 licensed entities and individuals um, but in, well, I think even more than that. Yeah. And, but there, are, I'd say, um, half a dozen to a dozen, uh, companies that, that, um, and varying degrees, you know, there are other companies like top productions that do sure. more, uh, French, French productions and things. So back to France again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we have, we have a French movie coming out next year too. Really? Yeah. yeah. So no one's listening. What, what, what is it about? Le Promet Vert. Le Promet Promise. Uh, La promesse verte. Yeah. The, the, the green promise. Yes. And it's um, a story set in Indonesia. It's about the, um, I believe it's about the logging industry, uh, illegal logging. Okay. Uh, taking place in Indonesia, shooting in Thailand. Exactly. Joel Silver said, the producer is the ultimate multitasker in filmmaking. Do you agree, I guess? Uh, it's, we know a little bit about a lot of things. A little bit about a lot of things. Yeah. So, as because you're the boss, <laughs> yeah. So I you're looking so. for people who know a lot about surround little your, subjects. Oh, no, or, you, no, you well, a lot about a lot. You, you, you <laughs> surround yourself with people who know a lot more about uh, each individual thing, and um, you know, and are passionate about. This. And you're recruiting, always. <laughs> it's Never open, stop. It's an open call. Yeah. Part three. Are you still alive? Yes, here. You are listening to Filming in Thailand, a podcast by Tarot Documentary, with your host, Stefan Lambert. Behind every successful film, there is a producer who believed in the project when no one else did. Uh, Attributed to Christopher Nolan, do you agree? Yes, and I I think on the production service side... um, we're not so involved in sort of the nascent stage and, and the birth of... But you mentioned a few times that now you are on the creative side, you are you know, yeah, and, giving uh, birth to project, <laughs> owning the IP. Exactly. So, um, so uh, you know, and then there are projects like A Prayer Before Dawn that came as a service job, but for various reasons, um, um, I ended up becoming um, in the on the ground creative producer. So... You know, there's never one way to, that it all happens, but I, I'd say yes, um, especially for, you know, if you are a creative producer, that's... that's Creative producer, um, I guess you, you, you are, you're encountering some interesting challenges when you are a creative producer and you have to work with a director with his own vision. So unless, I guess, you're, you're a partner, strong partner with the director, how do, you, how do you balance the fact that you are delivering a service and also having a say in the creative process? Because you have to, to, to manage a lot of ego. Yeah, but it's, um, I mean, I've found the, um, oh, it's... Uh, it can be a headache, I guess. Uh, or not? It's, I mean, it's, I've, I'm privileged having worked with Michael Mann, who is you just Google and, you know, Michael Mann problems directing or a difficult <laughs> director. And, but it's, you know, he, he also, you know, it's, it's what I talked about, um, about, you know, like seeing the creator, you're inside Scareth's head and you're like, oh my God, we pushed and pushed our crew and pushed the limits of the budget, but wow, he delivered. And, you know, I, I, for me, I, I see it as my job not to say no, not to, uh, you know, bitch about the budget, but really go to have a creative collaboration with the director and go, okay, what's important? You know, what are your priorities? You know, it's really, it's sad to spend a week on something that, you know, uh, it's only going to 30% chance that it's going to make the movie. So why don't we make the choice now? What's actually going to make 
make the film, you know, and that would be your 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 input. In in one circumstance, that might be the input. But or, I guess or, it depends also on the director you're working with. It depends on the director, depends on the project, and 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 you know how you're going. But and there, directors and you know it's. Um, situations where I'm much more hands-off there are other ones that are more hands-on and it's so um so you figure it out every time have you ever had to to deal with uh the ego's problem like that that could have completely jeopardized the, the production well definitely it's I won't tell you the films but the Often the biggest egos are on the uh, smallest films that end up going nowhere. Can you share with us the first, uh, I don't know, five to ten words of the title no. without no? <laughs> I'm not going. Uh, <laughs> no, not going to. But uh, um, no, it, it's. I, I'd say it's. Um, but maybe not in a bad way because dealing with ego's problem can be part of the creative process, and you have to balance what is really ego and is not creative, and and what is ego because there is a creative issue behind it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's, I, I find it sad when um, people's egos get in, get in the way and, and either kill projects or um, kill the chance of, um, of the project being successful. You know, it's, um, I've been on a, a producer on a movie where, um, you know, within the, it was, it's always financed. Um, almost always, and uh, especially for young directors, financed off of the um, off of the talent, and I could see, yeah. you know, um, the, the director in the circumstance losing the um, losing the uh, talent in the first days, and once you once you lose them, the you're not going to get a cup back, and and you know, and it was sad, and maybe I wasn't right in the way that I. Um, sort of delivered the news or, or tried to spur the uh, director on, but you know it's. So you, the the project. Uh, no, the, the, of, the, uh, of, I, the, I'm, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> Let's talk a bit more about the the IP that you're involved now. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, uh, a common answer from. Uh, Uh, from from streamers, from big players saying, uh, you know, you're in Thailand, so we want uh, IP uh, from Thailand with a Thai director, a Thai writer, a Thai cast, and Thai language. Uh, so does this does not apply to you? Um, it's interestingly enough. So I'd say during COVID, there I mentioned about Studio Muso already. We're basically we doing two things there. One is taking Japanese language and uh, bringing it to the world. So English language, live app, mainly live action um, adaptations. Mm -hmm. There are also a couple projects that are Japanese language um, that we have. Um, then um, uh, in Thailand, or through in, uh, 247 Pictures is uh, both Thai language um, for the local market, but then it's also some things have the... What we're looking for there is things that can uh, platform more internationally, whether through re uh, reselling the concept or... Uh, From your desk in the US. Th this would be something, some project, some, some stuff you, you are proposing from the desk in the, in, that you have in the US. No, no. Oh, it doesn't matter. Propose it uh, off of Sukhumvit. That's where it all comes from. <laughs> um, But uh, but then so in Sukhumvit being a famous street in Bangkok <laughs> exactly. Uh, with Indochina, there are a couple of properties that that I own or I'm attached to. Um, that let's say the the stories are um, they're, they're all English language. The stories are Asian based, um, and just from people I know and things. There's a Lawrence Osborne property, um, Water of Life, the uh, original script that I commissioned. Mm -hmm. um, It's set in Japan. It's a sideways, it's in lost in translation, set around whiskey. Um, but then it's recently, I had some agencies in the States contact me about um, directors that they represent here and asking um, for my possible help in producing English language projects for them here. And then recently, also some interesting... Um, Uh, interesting Thai language properties, uh, uh, narrated, scripted, um, have come my way. I think that the 
the question is 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 if if I'm going to I I find it a lot of the projects really interesting, but the streamers model um, isn't interesting to produce something for a million and a half, two million dollars, um, and which will take two to three years of your life, and then not to own any IP. And the fees that you get off of that are, I mean, if it was the only thing I was doing sure. or something or a different stage in my career, that might be um, interesting, but it's not. So I'm looking at for projects where I can own part of the IP, where um, they might end up on the streamers in various different ways, a, a later acquisition, or but there's also a theatrical window. E each project has um, different ways to set it up. Before we talk about uh, the, the where the industry is going and what's coming next, uh, I have this funny question, and you, you can use the buzzer if you okay. want to answer it. How, how someone becomes you? I, I don't think anyone wants to become. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, Are so, you sleeping at night? <laughs> no. So I would, um, I, if you don't mind, I'd rephrase it and, and please. Um, I'd say, how do you how do you become like how do you find yourself? And so all I've done is find sort of find myself in in what I like to do. I'm um, I'm living my dream, my passion. There was a time. Back in college that I tried acting, I was in an improv group in New York and had a lot of fun, but then also realized, oh my God, I can't, you know, I don't love it. Being, you know, in LA going to auditions, I realized I can't, I want to sit on the other side deciding I can't be putting myself out for rejection so much. And it's, I wasn't strong enough. Or... Working in a restaurant as a waiter was not for you. <laughs> Here we have... Um, a special machine called the time traveling machine. Uh -huh. So I'm going to bring you back in time. Then you were starting to to mention about uh, earlier time. Um, we are going to travel back to your 20s. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to uh, share with us what you think you would tell yourself when you were 20 years old. This is the time traveling machine. It's interesting you say that. So I never had a mentor. And I think that if I was able to go back, it would be nice to position yourself in that sort of mentor um, place. And and where I've, the biggest mistakes that I've made have been when I rushed and when I got too emotional. And if, if I, there are probably half a dozen to a dozen times and it's either ruined relationships um, or ruined friendships. And if I was able to um, take a breath, you know, and and not be emotional, uh, what do you think you uh, you went? What, why uh, you, is this a therapy session or a podcast? Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, for both. We, we charge you at the end. So. Okay. <laughs> so, wh why do you think you got emotional, or, or you were in a hurry? You. Um, you know, it, it's... And that's actually a therapy session. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, no, why, why did I get emotional? Because it, it's... Um, Maybe stress, uh, lack of money. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hit the buzzer now. No, um, <laughs> Please do. I, I think that it, it's because I, um, I put myself in positions sometimes where I didn't have the experience and, and the background to really just be able... And mm -hmm. that's where I... Like, not having a mentor who I could call and stuff and sometimes... I was surrounded by people who amped up the rhetoric and amped, and and this and this terrible. And instead of going, hey, just take a step back, make the call in two days. It's not like it's not going to change anything now. So you didn't know at that time, and you rushed into uh, yeah. Conclusion. And then I and I shot myself in the foot a couple of times. You can use the buzzer. Ah, uh, it's not. And now I start crying. <laughs> Kleenex, <laughs> please tissue for the gentleman. <laughs> Is there a future in in, in production services in Thailand? I mean, it is a really good question. It's something that I think that uh, we're tracking. You know, is locations, you know, is location shooting going to go or filming going to go um, the same way that uh, sort of shooting on on film, you know, is is like oh, that only a couple, you know, auteurs can can demand and get. Um, I, I feel in the next couple of years from what I've seen and what I've heard is, um, you know, lo location filming is, I mean, but they're uh, location filming 
will still be prevalent. Um, the quality of the um, of what you're getting off of virtual stages is, you know, and the, it hasn't gotten to that tipping point yet where it's so much cheaper shooting on the volume stage. You know, you still need to build 3D assets. You still need to, um, and that also has to be in your production pipeline. You know, but down the down the I mean, I actually see, you know, uh, where it also depends on what's your uh, who's your end user. You know, it's um, but you know I, the technology it's it's happening, and I think that it's actually going to probably affect local and regional markets before big international, um, just because. You know, imagine if you went on a volume stage and, okay, it doesn't look great, but you know what? You can make a Thai TV commercial then, you know, and then put Paris in the background. You can already do it on green screen, you know. And so then it devalue uh, all, 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 all the, 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 I mean, there is no more production value. If everything is possible, people don't believe what they see. People don't believe what they create, I mean, what they create. And But my worst nightmare would be, uh, you know, computers, Auto generating, auto generating um, content, creative content. But uh, look where the metaverse went. You know, Facebook has lost a lot of money, or Meta has lost. Is it Meta? What's yes. yeah? That has lost a huge amount of money with um, what's the uh, yeah the, Mark Zuckerberg's bet on everyone wanting to be in the metaverse, and you know what people actually. You know, COVID was another thing. Do we all want to live isolated and stuff? So I, th I think that there's no, it, it's going to be, things are definitely changing and changing on a very rapid um, basis. I think with, you know, AI, from what I'm hearing in TV commercials and, um, you know, face replacement and all that, just imagine you come to Thailand, you shoot, um, you have six countries that you need to do, uh carbonated beverage thing for sure you shoot it once and then you change everyone out absolutely and that's you know so you're that's um you know possibly where it's going to go so you know that's the, the technology technological change is happening i'm just trying to ride the wave we can imagine that there would be some mention shot with humans maybe or created out of a human brain yeah does it is it is it a risk or a challenge for your own business model? I mean, is there a strategy is, around that. I I wouldn't go out and build up a traditional, you know, start hiring three hundred people for a traditional production production service company. Um, I mean, we've always had a very lean model with uh, few, with very few permanent employees and really relying on freelancers. Um, you know, but it's, I'm still in the business. It's, it's changing. It's just going to be interested. And I think no one can predict where, how it's going to change. If you had to choose few films for people to watch and understand Thailand better or Southeast Asia better, oh. what, what film would you recommend? Oh, um, you mentioned, uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, from my, the, from my own, the ones I, I, please go see the creator, go see, um, goes uh, of how you know you can have an you can have an asian based temple um a, and as opposed to going to iceland or something watch a prayer with for dawn of going for me there's a movie that really um you know, have the director's vision and when a director knows what um to put it up on screen especially if it's all live action you know there are ways to really produce it and um, not have to spend a huge sum of money. Um, you know, I, for me, American Apocalypse Now is phenomenal. I think that the, and I was working with Oliver Stone on a project that didn't go through, but um, Platoon is, you know, and here's a young director who didn't get enough money and the stories behind how that was made was phenomenal. And it's, you know, I think it's a very, um, you know, you look at the script and the story, and it's it's very classical. It could be, you know, a, set in terms sure. of Greek or Roman mm -hmm. Empire or something, and um, but beautifully done. How um, oh good! What's uh, Eric Matisse on the job? 
um, a Filipino film. Um, I don't know this one. Yeah, it's where they hire um, uh, contract killers who are actually in prison, and then they get out of prison to go uh, kill people. Um, I think there's, um, you know, I've, what's the movie that XYZ did, The Raid? Um, the Raid, an Indonesian film um, that really sort of broke out internationally. Um, you know, I think they're fun. Uh, what's the uh, the um, ladyboy volleyball team in Thailand? Ah, yes. Oh, that's uh, you know that's some old. time ago. Yeah, some time ago. But I think that there is like something like that should be revisited too. And you know, so that's where I'm going all over on the on the genres. So we have the film that you recommend for people to watch and understand yeah. a bit better. Uh, yeah. And that's interesting that we we started mentioning. Uh, Um, Apocalypse Now, and we end up mentioning the creator, both uh, portraying the American um, fighting Asia for a cause. Uh, for, uh, we leave people uh, deciding <laughs> what they have to think about it, or yeah. uh, this is uh, another discussion. And uh, <laughs> Fiat will bring you the award okay. for best guest ever. For this episode, <laughs> oh, filming in Thailand, I feel honored. Yeah. Uh, you can. This is this is actually uh, the official mug uh, from uh, Tero Documentary. Tero oh, Documentary yeah. is one of our official sponsor and supporter. Uh, I had I, I, I created Tero Documentary. Okay, so <laughs> we we had a way to get them as a sponsor. Okay. <laughs> And that concludes this episode of uh, Filming in Thailand. The show is available on YouTube, Hoodie Podcast, and on all the leading podcast, podcast platforms. More detail uh, together with transcript and links, um, links to uh, the films, the many films you, you mentioned, you referred to, at uh, www.filminginthailand.com. Okay, people, fantastic. That's a wrap. It's been a thrill to have you with us today. Perfect. It's been a pleasure. See you on screen soon. Great. See you. And it's time for me to say... Et voilà. That was Filming in Thailand. An original podcast brought to you by Tarot Documentary on Rudy Podcast. With your host, Stefan Lombe. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode of Filming in Thailand. That's a wrap. Ah, okay. Hold on. Hold on one second. It did not record. We have to start. We, we, we make it shorter, but we have to start again from scratch. <laughs> <laughs>